uh, since the summer break. Um, today's lecture is about the contested state, and we look at the contest between neo-patrimonialism and the Weberian state. Weber himself said in politics of the vocation that it is a latent struggle um, between expert officialdom and autocratic rule. And this is, of course, premised on the notion that the two may coexist, but they may do so under a specific set of institutional arrangements and power arrangements. Um, so our case study today is the Filipino state, quite distant from the Middle East, but I think this is a um, timely competitive exercise today for us um, in light of recent developments in Syria, specifically in Daraa and Idlib. Um, I believe we raised the question about how um, state power and state structures recon are reconstituted in light of active contestation, both from within and, and from without. Um, so our guest speaker today is a dear colleague of mine, um, Dr. Balash Kovac. Um, his book, Peace, Infrastructures, and State Building at the Margins, just came out a few months ago. Highly recommended to scholars and researchers of um, state formation. Um, Dr. Kovac has a PhD from the University of New England in politics and international studies. Uh, his research focus is state theory and state society um, interactions. Currently, he is the country director in the Philippines, the Forum uh, ZFD. And prior to that, Dr. Kovac taught in international relations and peace and conflict studies. So Dr. Kovac, on behalf of the project, thank you for being here. And the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning. Uh, I am Balash Kovac, and I'm very pleased to be here. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm going to talk about the Philippines, which is, as I mentioned, quite far uh, from the Middle East. And uh, uh, I'm aware that your research program uh, is interested in states that are or have disintegrated. And uh, I'm going to talk about a state that is very weak, but somehow it has always failed disintegrated. Uh, and I hope that there will be something interesting in it uh, for you. Uh, a small comment on the title. I'm not going to bore you with the peace building program of the Aquino government. Uh, it is to situate the particular instance in history uh, where the confluence of these contestations uh, could take place. Uh, so this is about uh, the title. So let me give you a bit more of an introduction as to what I intend to talk about. Uh, the Philippine state uh, has consistently been described as, uh, as a weak state. Uh, and it is uh, indeed quite weak in some ways, which I'm going to discuss very soon. Uh, but it is also a very resilient state at the same time. Uh, so I'm going to start uh, tracing the sources of this uh, weakness and resilience uh, by uh, discussing the state formation process of the Philippines um, from late Spanish colonial times. Um, I'm going to talk about two kinds of contestation after this. Uh, contestation that comes from the outside, and when I say outside, I do not mean uh, external to the sovereign state of the Philippines, that is not foreign countries, uh, but external to the state itself, so I'm going to talk about uh, particularly two insurgencies, uh, the communist insurgency that spans the entire archipelago, and uh, the Moro struggle, the Muslim insurgency that seeks to secede from the Philippine state uh, in uh, the southern uh, island of Mindanao. And I'm going to talk about uh, another contestation which uh, is not really covered in the literature. Uh, the communist insurgency and the Moro struggle especially have been very widely covered in the literature. Uh, the one I'm talking about uh, is, uh, uh, has received much less attention. Uh, and this is what Harold in his uh, introduction mentioned about this latent struggle between expert official dom. And in our case, not an autocratic state, but an oligarchic state. Uh, and how uh, a particular stratum uh, within the state bureaucracy uh, sought to somehow challenge and transform the neo-patrimonial character of the state. Uh, and finally, I'm going to give a few pointers as to why the Philippine state is resilient and why it doesn't uh, disintegrate, or to put it 
the other way, uh, why these contestations have failed uh, in fundamentally challenging or transforming the Philippine state. So what do I mean in the context of this seminar uh, by uh, the weakness of the Philippine state and what do I mean by the resilience of it? Uh, the Philippine state is remarkably inefficient uh, in formulating and implementing policies. Uh, so both the policy making and the policy implementation capacity of the Philippine state is low. Uh, it obviously has not been able uh, to successfully claim the monopoly of violence within its territory, uh, but it has also been uh, modestly successful at best in claiming the monopoly of regulation, uh, for example. Uh, so social relations uh, are not regulated by the state to the extent uh, that uh, they are in more successful uh, modern states. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, it's the low capacity of the Philippine state uh, to physically and institutionally penetrate uh, Philippine society. Uh, when, I mean, when I say physically, I'm talking about the actual physical reach of the state. Uh, its physical infrastructure, its roads, its schools, its courthouses, uh, uh, which already takes us to the institutional penetration. In many parts of the Philippine state, uh, people do not rely on state institutions uh, to mediate their conflicts or to resolve their conflicts. Uh, they resort to other sets of rules and other institutions, uh, most of which have predated the Philippine state. Uh, and uh, when I talk about uh, resilience, I mean uh, the relatively high capacity of this state to, stay, to safeguard its own institutional structure at the center. Uh, and when I say center, I mean Manila and the major urban centers uh, in particular, uh, and uh, itself as a system of domination. Uh, so as, uh, as a system of domination, the Philippine state, uh, I would claim, has been especially successful uh, in the last uh, more than 100 years. Uh, it is very capable of creating alliances uh, with other actors in society, uh, which uh, uh, the state uses uh, to uh, stabilize uh, itself. And it has been quite successful in penetrating Philippine society ideologically. Uh, specifically, I mean a statist ideology. The expectation uh, of uh, large parts of Philippine society that a state would eventually come, that the state is supposed to provide certain services. Uh, many uh, surveys have shown that this seemingly contradictory result, uh, where people express very high disappointment with the actual performance of the state, rightly so, because it is quite low. At the same time, uh, they have uh, very positive views of the state as an abstract concept, uh, something that should and eventually will provide them uh, services, from education to healthcare and prosperity uh, in uh, general. I'll show you a quick Thought. Don't worry, we are not going to go through it all. This is from an interview that I conducted uh, with a scholar, a political scientist. Um, and uh, I wanted to ask her about uh, the state's monopoly of violence. Uh, and I introduced my question by saying, Weber defines the state. And she got in and she stopped me uh, right there and said, Weber is not applicable in the Asian context. Uh, after that, she went on uh, referring to Weber nonstop uh, in describing the Philippine state. Uh, so obviously, uh, Weber does apply. But her main research interest uh, is local governance uh, and uh, the functioning of the bureaucracy. And so she described to me uh, how structurally on the outside there is this appearance of a modern Weberian state with all the trappings. Uh, that a modern state has, but on the inside, uh, informality, personalism, uh, and charismatic and traditional leadership styles uh, define the actual functioning of the Philippine uh, state. And this is, uh, this is a crucial element uh, to particularly uh, the internal contestation of the state that I am going to uh, talk about. 
if you don't mind, I move on. And I will now talk about uh, the state formation process of the Philippines. Uh, I need to begin with a caveat. Uh, I'm going to spend maybe 10, 15 minutes uh, trying to cover a historical period of approximately 150 to 200 years. Uh, the resulting image is going to be unnaturally linear. Uh, naturally, the actual historical process that produced uh, what I'm going to talk about today uh, has been a lot more topsy-turvy. Uh, it is going to be a reconstruction, my reconstruction to be exact, uh, of how I think the present state of the Philippine state has come about. So that's the first uh, caveat. It was not nearly as linear as it will seem in my presentation. Uh, I don't think that uh, what transpired uh, follows some kind of rules of history uh, or laws of history. Uh, it has been decisions which were informed by class interests and individual interests to the great, to great extent. Nevertheless, uh, they have been informed uh, by these. Uh, history could have taken other turns uh, on various junction points, and they didn't. So again, this goes back uh, to the linearity of my narrative of Philippine uh, state formation. <clears throat> when we talk about uh, this kind of reconstruction uh, and historicizing the present state uh, of a polity, uh, one particular consideration needs to be given uh, to the question of continuity and change. Uh, what is it that, uh, that somehow is preserved, in what form, and what it is that changes? Uh, again, this kind of reconstruction of a process has the tendency to emphasize uh, the continuities uh, in this process. Um, but of course, we can't extrapolate what happened uh, in 1919 to what's happening now in 2018 uh, exactly. There is, however, quite a high degree of continuity. For example, if we look at uh, the oligarchic families that currently rule the Philippines, uh, quite a few of those families uh, were already present uh, during uh, late uh, Spanish colonial times. So if you want to look them up, the Ayalas, the Araletas, the Osmeñas, uh, the Parto de Taveras, all these big families that are at present are uh, crucial in deciding what happens uh, in the Philippines, they're already there. Uh, hundreds of other political dynasties, however, emerged since, so they were not there. So there is this continuity and change. I'm going to discuss the emergence of a unified uh, oligarchic elite in the late Spanish colonial period. Um, and in some ways, we still have a unified political uh, economic oligarchic elite uh, that uh, rules the country, but the composition of this elite is very different. The composition of the families that constitute this stratum of society, but also the composition of the sources of their power and the sources of their wealth have diversified to a great extent. So after these caveats about continuity and change and the linearity of my reproduction of this process, let me give you this linear reproduction of the process. Um, uh, since I expect that most of you are not uh, as avid uh, students of Philippine uh, history and politics as I am, uh, let me begin with a very quick uh, situation. So this is uh, the Philippines, which is comprised of three major uh, island groupings, Luzon in the north, Mindanao uh, in the south, and that small island region in the middle called the Visayas. Uh, much of the original state formation process took place uh, in the region around Manila. It is known as the Tagalog uh, region because that's where the Tagalog-speaking uh, people of the Philippines are from. Uh, and then <clears throat> it sort of emanated from there with Cebu as another major center of the Philippine state formation process in the late Spanish early American colonial times. Um, the Spanish colonial period stretches 333 years, uh, and it ended in 1898, uh, when the United States took over in the Spanish-American War. Uh, the American colonial state existed in the Philippines until 1946. 
the Americans promised independence to the Philippines by 1945. Uh, the Japanese invasion uh, and occupation of the Philippines uh, set it back by one year. And uh, the period since 1946 uh, is the period of the independent Philippine state. Uh, studies that deal with this last period uh, include further peri periodization, which I'm going to refer to later on, uh, between uh, independence and the imposition of uh, martial law by uh, Ferdinand Marcos, uh, the Marcos period, and then the post-Marcos or restored democratic period. Um, so, Spain arrived in the late 16th century uh, to the Philippines as a colonizing power, and for the remaining three centuries, it was what I would describe as a half-hearted colonizer. Uh, <clears throat> the main weight of Spanish colonialism uh, was in Latin America, uh, and when the Spanish colonizers came, they very quickly found out uh, that, that the, the resources available uh, in the archipelago are not really comparable uh, to those that they could extract from uh, the Americas. Um, it was also very far, so uh, there were very few Spaniards who had an interest in moving to the Philippines. So all through the period, uh, Spain had a human resource problem. Uh, there were way too few Spaniards who had an interest to come uh, and colonize the country and rule the country. So this led to uh, the emergence of what we could call a mediated state. Um, and there were particularly two intermediaries that the Spanish colonial authorities relied on to project state power uh, further away from the main uh, urban centers. And one was the Catholic state in the Catholic Church, to which uh, Spain basically deputized the exercise of most state functions outside uh, Manila, Cebu, and a few other uh, urban centers. And the emergence of a new stratum in society, uh, which they called the Principalia. Uh, the Principalia were appointed officials uh, from the local population. Uh, the Spanish appointed these leaders who uh, served as mayors and village heads uh, from uh, the pre-colonial ruling class uh, of the Philippines. Uh, but this appointment fundamentally changed uh, or transformed the sources of legitimation uh, and the way uh, this stratum of society exercised power uh, among uh, the co-patriots. Earlier in pre-colonial times, there existed a hereditary, quote-unquote, aristocracy. Um, but actual leadership positions uh, tended to be filled uh, through a demonstration of prowess. So just because somebody came from this uh, hereditary stratum of aristocracy or nobility was no guarantee that they would inherit the titles that their fathers uh, had. Um, <clears throat> uh, with Spanish appointment, however, this changed. And the, the earlier charismatic legitimacy now transformed into more traditional forms uh, of legitimation, and the titles themselves became hereditary. Uh, with this, we get to my next point, uh, which will be important in the capitalist transformation uh, of the Philippine economy. Um, in the late 18th, early 19th century, uh, the Philippine colonial state went through a crisis which peaked in the early 1800s uh, with the loss of the Latin American colonies of Spain. Uh, and uh, that uh, precipitated uh, a response from the Spanish state. Uh, namely, uh, they decided to approach the problem in two ways. Uh, one was uh, to facilitate the capitalist transformation uh, of the economy. Uh, and the other was uh, a state building process. Um, earlier, there was some surplus uh, extracted from agriculture, uh, which served to enrich the landowners, uh, some of them Spaniards, the Catholic Church, and this new stratum, the Principalia. Uh, but uh, in the mid 19th century, uh, Spain started promoting the planting of cash crops instead of rice. Uh, 
uh, and uh, a deeper integration uh, in the global economy. This uh, transformed the rural relations between landowners uh, and uh, their peasants, uh, <clears throat> leading to uh, increased precarity uh, and, uh, and uh, impoverishment. Uh, during the feudal times, uh, there was a very unequal, but nevertheless reciprocal relations between landowners uh, and uh, the peasants, uh, which was uh, uh, which slowly gave way uh, to more instrumental uh, relations uh, between them. Uh, earlier, land ownership uh, depended on being the representative of the Spanish state. So the early Spanish colonizers uh, received landed estates called encomiendas um, in exchange for them representing the Spanish colonial authorities. The church slightly different. The Principalia also received land grants because they were the representatives of the state. With this capitalist transformation, however, uh, and uh, the increase in uh, private land ownership, uh, this relationship turned around. And uh, now the state sought out landowners uh, to represent it, rather than sending representatives who would then be uh, landowners and become rich as a result of uh, uh, being state representatives. The other consequence of uh, this integration in global economy is capital accumulation, uh, especially in the poor cities, and the rise of an urban uh, bourgeoisie. So this was one answer that Spain tried to give uh, to the crisis uh, that uh, was created primarily by the end of uh, the trade between China and Mexico via Manila. The other was uh, a very late attempt to build a modern state. Uh, so uh, as I mentioned, most of the state functions were deputized to the church uh, or were carried out through these representatives of the state. Now Spain scrambled to create very state institutions. Uh, they introduced very limited, and I mean very limited, uh, local and provincial elections. Uh, they introduced uh, personal identification to make the population more legible uh, for taxation purposes. Uh, this is by the time, this is by the way the time when uh, family names were introduced in the Philippines and this is why most Filipinos that you meet have a Spanish family name because they were simply assigned by the authorities a family name. Uh, and they introduced Spanish language, com language compulsory elementary education. This, however, came so late that it laid some of the groundwork for later uh, state building uh, projects, but it itself was not able to save uh, the Spanish colonial state in the Philippines. Uh, the most important outcome of this process, however, is the emergence of a unified colonial elite, uh, which came from two sources. Uh, the landed aristocracy in the hinterlands uh, and uh, the urban bourgeoisie I mentioned before. Uh, what's very important to see here is that they were not only connected by wealth, but they also cross-invested. So uh, these uh, elite families who came from an urban setting and made their wealth from trade, they invested in land. Uh, and the landed aristocracy invested in trade ventures and acquired monopolies and so on. Uh, with that, uh, we see the birth of the Philippine oligarchy that exists today, where uh, families basically have economic holdings that compass most uh, areas of economic activity. Just to give you a hint, less than 10% of the major corporations in the Philippines are present at the stock exchange. More than 90% of all Philippine companies are family-owned. And we are talking about uh, huge multi-billion uh, corporations uh, that are never introduced to the stock market because the families uh, keep the complete control of these uh, corporations within them. And they have holdings in media, in food production, in agriculture, uh, in banking, and so on and so forth, all within one family conglomerate. So the major, the biggest dynasty families uh, have these portfolios uh, over which they have complete uh, control. Now, unlike Latin America, 
uh, in the Philippines, Spanish never became a majority language. In 1898, at the end of Spanish colonialism, approximately 5% of the population spoke Spanish. Uh, and those were also uh, members of the educated elite. So there was, uh, there was an elite which was not only uh, connected through its wealth and its class and status, but also having a lingua franca, which the rest of the population didn't have. Uh, the rest of the Philippines speaks uh, 120 languages broken into 374 uh, dialects. And finally, there was an emerging nationalism that connected uh, this uh, new uh, oligarchy uh, elite. This is where the Americans came in. Uh, and they immediately moved first to co-opt this oligarchic elite, and second, uh, to build a modern state. There were two particular measures that they took uh, in order uh, to co-opt uh, the oligarchic families. Uh, one was ending the friars' influence, uh, which created the vacuum that they could fill, the political space. Uh, and the other was uh, introducing uh, electoral politics. I'm going to talk about that very soon. Uh, and they also started their state building uh, enterprise really early. The Spanish American, the, uh, the American, Philippine American War ended in 1902, but in 1900 they already created a Bureau of Civil Service. They established the Philippine Constabulary to consolidate their security. And they introduced right away public education uh, for all in the English language which is why even though most people from the Philippines really have Spanish surnames, they will all speak English uh, and not Spanish. Uh, so the Americans justified that colonial rule over the Philippines uh, to the Filipinos and to themselves uh, by claiming that they, they have some kind of uh, duty uh, to teach Filipinos uh, democracy and to somehow create a democratic polity uh, in the Philippines. Uh, they introduced elections very early on. Uh, in already 1902, they had uh, local and provincial elections uh, with a franchise of approximately 1.5% uh, of the total population. Uh, that meant that basically only uh, this political elite was eligible both to vote and to be voted. Uh, and that was the first uh, time that this uh, economic elite was able to step into the political arena uh, and claim its place. Um, as we see, by 1907, the National Assembly was composed through elections. And by 1935, the president of the Commonwealth was elected. Uh, the franchise expanded uh, as well in this uh, period. Now, this is important for us because uh, all the elected positions and the key political power was held by uh, the elite. There was nobody else who had access to it. Uh, and they entrenched themselves very early on uh, through this. Uh, there were three major factors in the entrenchment of the oligarchy. First, uh, was uh, an ideological uh, shift from an interest to create a state to an interest in creating a democracy. And that means that uh, from the beginning of the American colonial period, uh, elected officials had primacy over state bureaucrats. Uh, they uh, were clearly uh, preferred and they had the power uh, to decide over matters of uh, the bureaucracy. So the central bureaucracy uh, enjoyed uh, very little autonomy from uh, the elected politicians who were also uh, the economic elite of uh, the country. Uh, similarly to the US, uh, they introduced a spoil system. Now again, similarly to the Spanish, uh, the American authorities also had a human resource problem because similarly to the Spanish, no Americans wanted to come to the Philippines. It was just not a very attractive place to come. Uh, so very early on, uh, the Americans decided to start the process of Filipinization. It's not only because of this shortage of manpower that they did this, 
Uh, it is also the outcome of uh, internal debates in the metropole in the United States about how to manage the Philippine colony, but uh, I'm not going to go into those uh, debates uh, here. The decision was made to Filipinize the institutions. Uh, and that means that elected politicians were able to bring their clients into the bureaucracy and basically turn the central bureaucracy of the state um, into a machinery that serves their own interests. And this is when uh, this interconnection between uh, the oligarchic elite and the subservient bureaucracy uh, begins. Uh, bureaucrats owed their positions to elected politicians, um, and because of that, they served uh, their interests. Uh, finally, because of the political system introduced, uh, the electoral system introduced, uh, a political machine emerged in the Philippines, which is very similar, by the way, uh, to the machine politics that the United States had uh, in the early 20th century. Uh, and because of that, uh, political power concentrated at the local, specifically at the municipal level, from where uh, these political dynasties were able to uh, produce the votes for the higher levels. So my contention here, and this is why when I, let's say, diverge from the mainstream historiography, uh, is that there was a very significant input from the American colonial authorities, but the American colonial state was actually built by and for the Philippine oligarchy. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it seems to be a colonial state, at the, on the outside, uh, but uh, the Philippine political elite, with their much greater knowledge of local conditions, their familiarity with the landscape, uh, were very adept at manipulating the colonial authorities uh, and were able uh, to shape the polity to serve their own interests. Uh, so uh, obviously it was not an economically bad deal for the United States. Uh, but I would contend that from uh, the early mid American colonial period, we can already talk about a Philippine state rather than uh, purely an American uh, colony. So, <clears throat> very often agency is attributed to uh, external colonizers. I think here the agency of the Philippine aristocracy uh, was very strong uh, in shaping the state in their own uh, interest sometimes against the interests of the United States. In fact, this deal was so good for uh, the Philippine elite that uh, most of the leading politicians of the 1930s, uh, when uh, the promised date of independence was approximating, were actually going to Washington and they tried to lobby the government, the federal government, not <coughs> to give up the colony because it was, it was an excellent deal. Uh, for that. Uh, nevertheless, the colony was given up and the Philippines became an independent state. Uh, uh, I will change a bit of tech now and instead of a uh, more chronological uh, discussion, I'm going to cover three of the main theoretical frameworks in, in which uh, theorists sought to explain uh, the contemporary independent Philippine state. Uh, each one somehow corresponds uh, to a particular period. Uh, so first, the patron-client framework sought to explain Philippine politics, particularly why is it that the political parties in the Philippines are virtually identical to each other. There was no uh, discernible ideological difference between Philippine political parties. That remains to be the case, more or less, with some modification up to now. Um, and this stipulated the existence of harmonious vertical connections. So it is somehow reproducing a feudal uh, vision of a society, which by that time didn't quite exist. Uh, but a lot of the violence and the coercion that took place in this system uh, was not immediately visible. Uh, at the time. During Marcos time, especially on the political left, uh, the neo-colonial dependency framework took hold, uh, which said that the Philippines is, is ruled by a conquered elite, uh, 
which is maintained in power uh, through external largess and resource input. Now, <clears throat> that is not exactly, uh, that was never exactly the case in my opinion. Nevertheless, uh, external resource input has always been an important source uh, of uh, systemic stability uh, in the Philippines, uh, particularly in maintaining uh, a system of domination uh, by the oligarchic uh, elite. <clears throat> This again is something that underwent quite serious transformation. Um, while in the 1960s and 1970s, much of the direct uh, resource investment came from, uh, in the form of uh, foreign direct investment, mostly from the United States. Uh, today, for example, uh, in January, during the, from, in the year 2017, uh, the total FDI of the Philippines uh, was just over 10 billion uh, US dollars. Uh, while in the same period, uh, the remittances sent by uh, overseas Filipino workers uh, back home uh, was over 13 billion uh, US dollars. Uh, so in that sense, a lot of uh, the external resource input uh, originates not from capitalist uh, connections, uh, but through the remittances uh, of uh, workers who go uh, and work mostly in the Middle East uh, and elsewhere. Uh, and that, of course, changes uh, how uh, this uh, input shapes uh, politics. It's not directly uh, channeled to particular families. Although in 2011, uh, a study showed uh, that the, by then quite high economic or GDP growth uh, which was about 6% at the time, 76% uh, of the GDP growth in 2011 uh, was captured by the 40 richest families. Uh, in comparison, uh, the second most unequal uh, distribution of GDP growth was in Thailand, and that was 33.6% uh, going to the top 40 families in the country. So this gives you an idea uh, of uh, the, the economic domination uh, of the Philippines uh, by its uh, oligarchic families. And after Marcos was ousted, uh, uh, there was a period, since then we're talking about uh, a period of restored democracy, but it is also uh, a period of restored oligarchic rules, uh, oligarchic rule uh, in the country. Uh, there is formal democracy, elections have been restored, uh, but they are not really contested. The Philippines has the highest uh, percentage of uh, dynastic politicians, depending on how you uh, calculate, 70 to 75 percent of the members of Congress come from dynastic political families. Uh, so this is a very high uh, proportion. I think in the United States it's uh, 6 percent. Um, so um, it is a formal democracy, uh, but real power is not contested uh, in uh, the election. Uh, so in the end, the independent Philippine state ended up having the trappings of a barbarian state. It, it has government departments, it has a, a, a military, it has a police uh, force, uh, but um, it is better understood or more easily understood uh, as a relational space where power fluctuates uh, within a particular stratum of society uh, and between this uh, stratum and the rest of Philippine society. So it is not a human community that successfully claims the monopoly of the legendary use of physical force within a given territory, but a relation of man dominating man, a relation supported by means of legitimate, i.e. considered to be legitimate violence. Uh, as we will discuss, not all of this violence is considered to be legitimate. Now, the contestation. Uh, I'm going to talk briefly about three forms of contestation. Uh, two come from the margins, so to speak, the moral struggle and the communist insurgency. Uh, and one from within, although in some ways this is also from the margins. I will explain uh, why I'm saying this. Uh, 
The moral conflict, it really began a long time ago, but the current uh, insurgency began in the late 1960s uh, at the geographical margins of the society. Uh, basically, it is the frontier insurgency. Uh, it is secessionist in nature, and it has uh, serious ethnic, religious, uh, and linguistic overtones. I'm saying they have overtones because uh, religion and ethnicity have played a significant role uh, ever since uh, the insurgency broke out, uh, but key drivers of these conflicts are not religious or ethnic or linguistic in nature, uh, rather they are economic. Uh, and uh, it really begins uh, with a rift between uh, Marcos and the strongman who mediated the state uh, in the 1950s and 1960s um, in uh, Muslim uh, Mindanao. Uh, the other conflict, uh, conflict with the Communist Party of the Philippines, New People's Army, National Democratic Front of the Philippines, uh, is coming from the socio-economic margins and to some, in some ways from uh, the geographical margins because it is a rural-based insurgency uh, that comes from the hinterlands. And uh, being Maoist in nature, they seem to engulf the cities uh, and take over uh, the country from the countryside. Uh, they, uh, uh, they claim that the Philippines is semi-feudal and semi-colonial in nature, and they claim that their struggle is to overcome this semi-feudal and semi-colonial state. Um, both of these have been very resilient uh, to military defeat, uh, but at the same time, neither has been able to achieve its objectives, and in the end, the Philippine state has been able to successfully accommodate uh, or contain these uh, challenges. Now, the other one is uh, very different. I call this group of people the Filipino Fabians. I call them Fabians because in some ways, I think they are reminiscent of the British Fabian society, uh, in that the people who belong to this group, which is really not uh, a, an organized entity like the Fabian society, uh, it is a community of discourse, of like-minded people, uh, whose profile can be quite accurately, accurately drawn. Um, they are uh, educated, People usually concentrated in academia, uh, in non-governmental organizations, and in certain pockets of the government or the state uh, bureaucracy. Uh, and they speak the same language. And that language is the language of uh, barbarian bureaucracy. That is a language uh, of uh, a rational legal bureaucratic state, a service providing state, and, and very importantly, a depoliticized state. This is not the first time that such a group somehow uh, moved into the government. The first major instance of that was under the Marcos dictatorship, uh, which was which sought to become a developmentalist dictatorship in the image of Singapore and South Korea, uh, and failed at that. And Marcos allowed quite ample space for the technocrats to carry out uh, developmentalist projects. Um, uh, within the state. Uh, and a similar uh, situation happened under the Aquino administration, uh, where uh, another group, this group that I refer to as the Filipino Fabians, uh, were allowed to move in, in large numbers, into the central bureaucracy, uh, and uh, were given quite uh, free reign uh, to design policies and try to implement policies. Uh, they were progressive uh, in nature in as much as they sought to uh, overcome poverty and to some extent inequality. Uh, their goal was to really create a service providing state. It is neoliberal uh, in that they saw their role as, uh, uh, as depoliticized, as primarily uh, trying to solve problems uh, as technical challenges rather than political. Uh, challenges, um, and they used the peace building counterinsurgency program in particular uh, 
to try to promote this agenda. Uh, I will discuss how the Philippine state has never really faced a major external challenge uh, before, uh, but uh, the internal armed conflicts uh, created uh, the opportunity uh, for this group uh, to try to remake social relations and redesign social relations uh, between these oligarchic families and the people uh, in the municipalities where political power is still concentrated. Uh, so their goal was uh, to penetrate hither to unreached segments of the population. This is a twofold objective. One was uh, related to the counterinsurgency campaign. Uh, the military literally wanted to create inroads into uh, rebel areas. Uh, but it was also uh, to indoctrinate uh, villagers uh, and uh, people in municipalities in what I would call the state's way of doing things. Uh, they went out and they tried to train people into how to write grant proposals, uh, how to manage state funding projects, into reporting techniques, and so on and so forth. Uh, so uh, they try to bring people into a bureaucratic mindset and jolt them out from uh, the more informal ways of uh, uh, generating strategies of survival uh, in a patronage-based neo-patrimonial uh, system. Um, so as a community of discourse, uh, they are recognizable, but they never achieved to create a political program. Uh, when you read the op-eds in the newspapers, when you listen to them in meetings, you immediately recognize uh, who they are, because they all use very similar language. Uh, but unlike uh, Fabians in late 19th century uh, England, uh, they never really recognized uh, the possibility in organizing here. Uh, and because of that, they trapped the opportunity, many members of this community of this course, uh, to move into government uh, and somehow try to intensify this latent struggle between uh, between the expert officialdom that they became and the oligarchic rule uh, of the Philippine state. But uh, they uh, were ousted the moment uh, Aquino was out of the government, which shows the weakness of this challenge uh, against uh, the state. Uh, another, uh, another instance where their weakness was shown is that they actually achieved quite a high degree of success in uh, transforming how villages run their businesses. Uh, but as the moment they reached the municipalities uh, where uh, the oligarchic families hold power, uh, all their efforts uh, basically failed and they could not penetrate that level already. They also targeted uh, the central administration and they sought to train and retrain uh, members of the central bureaucracy in different line agencies of the government. Uh, but then again, uh, that effort also failed. Uh, so they were able uh, to achieve some success in remote conflict affected villages, but the moment they tried to move beyond that uh, to the central administration, uh, how business is conducted uh, in the bureaucracy, uh, how business is conducted, where real hard political power came into contact with their project, they uh, failed to achieve that. I would like to close this part with this very interesting uh, quote, which is also from another interview uh, with a village leader who comes from an old Spanish family. Uh, he was 80 plus at the time I interviewed him, and uh, his family had been the landowning family in that area. Uh, since the, the early, early 20th century, so for nearly 100 years. And uh, he said this, Pamana is one of the flagship projects that these Filipino premiums uh, used to penetrate uh, society. So see, he said that they encouraged the NBA, the New People's Army, the communist guerrilla movement, by indoctrinating the people to a new kind of thinking. Uh, 
they are trying to break the bond between the barangay leaders, those are the village leaders, and, and the community, which has existed for time immemorial. It is against the traditional way of life. Uh, this comes, this complaint comes uh, from an old, very insightful member uh, of the traditional uh, aristocracy. Uh, and they saw uh, the attempts of this group of people uh, very clearly to break this neo-patrimonial relationship, uh, this patronage-based relationship between him and uh, his villager. Uh, and he likens them uh, to the communist guerrillas because both of them are modernizers. Uh, they both seek to create uh, a modern state. Uh, the communists want to create the Stalinist uh, modern state. Uh, the Filipino Fabians, a neoliberal uh, modern state. But both of them challenge how power is generated and exercised in the Philippines. And uh, I'm going to uh, conclude by pointing to some sources of the state's resilience. Uh, one is ideological. I already mentioned the statist ideology, uh, that people, even though they know that the state is not performing the way they think the state should perform, nevertheless, they believe that the state should and will perform. Uh, and uh, that belief uh, seems to hold very strong over a long period of time. Um, and the myth that the Philippines is a democracy, it gives a certain kind of electoral legitimacy uh, to the politicians who are in Congress. Uh, even though everybody knows that they sold their votes uh, to get somebody to the Congress, or they know that they voted uh, at gunpoint because they were coerced uh, to do so, nevertheless, at the societal level, by virtue of having elections, uh, the system is seen as legitimate, uh, as, they, as, as if there was some serious input legitimacy uh, in the system itself. There is no genuine elite competition. Competition among elite families is very intense, but it is very, very circumscribed. circumscribed. It's very narrow. Um, Occasionally, they throw each other to jail, uh, and after a few years, they come back, and then they compete, and they become uh, elected politicians again. Uh, I'm talking about former presidents who did jail time and now um, are again elected uh, politicians. Uh, <clears throat> there is a particular concept in Philippine political science called turnpotism, uh, which, is, which describes the phenomenon that right after the elections, uh, most politicians uh, from the losing party, switch sides and turn over to the government, uh, to the president's political party, to ensure that they are close to the port barrel and they are able to continue the patronage uh, to their constituency. And um, as I mentioned, new dynasties have emerged, and the sources of their wealth and power come from various bases. Uh, so there has been a great deal of uh, diversification since then. Uh, nevertheless, they assimilate into this elite culture very fast. And they adopt uh, the ways uh, in which politics is conducted in the country uh, really fast. So even though there are uh, newcomers to the system, they adopt uh, how politics is conducted. Uh, perhaps you have heard about Manny Pacquiao. Uh, he is uh, pound by pound the world's best boxer uh, at the moment, and he is now a senator in the Philippines. Um, and now he is already building his own dynasty. He was a street kid, he became a world famous boxer, uh, amassed a huge amount of wealth, got himself elected to the Senate, and now he is building uh, a dynasty some 100, 120 kilometers from where I live. Uh, so he is now becoming the founder of a new political dynasty. And the way he conducts and the way he does politics is very similar to how everybody else has done politics. Uh, so in that sense, there is a lot of change uh, at one level, but there is also very strong continuity uh, because of this inculturation uh, of uh, the new political dynasties into the old ways of doing things. They have a stranglehold of the economy, the political dynasties, which again uh, maintains uh, 
their domination or stabilizes their domination uh, over society. Uh, I already talked about external resources, uh, which again stabilize the system in two ways. Uh, they contribute to the wealth of these families that can be spent on patronage, uh, but they also alleviate a lot of the social unrest uh, by uh, getting uh, direct remittances from abroad. So uh, even though there is rampant poverty, uh, people often have enough to get by thanks to the relatives who work abroad and send money back home. Uh, in fact, the Philippine state has cultivated this uh, intensively uh, and developed a human resources as a prime uh, export commodity uh, from the Philippines. Uh, the vertical patronage ties still exist. Uh, they are a lot more instrumental uh, and a lot less personal than they used to be, uh, but nevertheless, uh, they persist. Uh, there is still no significant external existential pressure that would force some kind of fundamental structural change within the state. And ultimately, violence is used by uh, the elite families uh, to put down unrest uh, locally. Uh, and these are the specific challenges. Uh, there are local accommodations uh, uh, between the state uh, and the emergence uh, and the uh, insurgencies. Uh, families hedge. Sometimes uh, families send a few or clans send a few people from the family to serve in the new people's army, and others from the same clan go to serve in the paramilitary or the or the, or the army. Uh, so uh, they hedge their bets. Uh, the MPA uh, has found very nice accommodations with local politicians and, uh, and corporations. SOP is standard operating uh, uh, procedure. Uh, the MPA calls it revolutionary tax. Uh, the government calls it extortion. Uh, uh, they, they have a very nice uh, modus vivendi. Uh, with uh, evil capitalist uh, companies who, when they pay the tax, uh, are allowed to operate uh, uninter uh, unperturbed. Um, and there are many bargains at the higher levels, especially the Moro insurgency. Uh, there are many ethnic bargains between the Muslim elites, the insurgent elites, and uh, the state. And uh, I already talked about uh, the Filipino Fabians, that the spoil system and the change of government effectively ejected them from their positions where they could challenge uh, the patrimonial uh, character of the state, uh, but also their own reformism is an effective uh, limit to their own capacity to create effective uh, change because they are invested in maintaining uh, the hollow democratic system which actually uh, generates and regenerates uh, the phenomena they uh, seek to challenge, uh, corruption, patronage, inequality, and so on. Uh, so that would be it, uh, because uh, I want you to go on, uh, a way, on a happy note, I'm going to show you pictures, uh, but these are pictures that somehow illustrate what I talked about. I took this picture in northeastern Mindanao, uh, it is a nickel mine. Uh, the key bits of information on this picture uh, are here. Uh, this is the CEO of the mining company. Now, it doesn't mean anything to you, but if you drive around that province, it's Surigao del Sur province, almost every town has a mayor called Pimentel. Uh, the governor of the province is called Pimentel. Uh, it's not a coincidence. Uh, they own the mines, they own most of the economy, uh, and they fill uh, all the, the elected political positions uh, in that particular province. They literally are the kings of the province. Um, the next bit of information you see is up there. Uh, the mine is protected that says KM90 Patrol Base. That's an armed forces of the Philippines uh, outpost, uh, which uh, provides protection to the privately owned mine of the political dynasty that rules the province. Uh, and uh, if 
allegations are true, and I have no way of verifying that. Uh, the military only does this protection uh, during daytime uh, because uh, allegedly uh, at nighttime the new people's army provides the same protection uh, because the mining company allegedly pays uh, the revolutionary tax. Uh, this is from the internet. Uh, these are so-called uh, permits to campaign. This is another form of accommodation uh, between uh, the New People's Army and the political elite. Uh, every time there is an election, uh, in areas where the New People's Army holds sway, uh, they sell permits to campaign. They basically receive money uh, in exchange for allowing uh, campaigning politicians access to the constituency. If you pay, you can go and campaign. Uh, once you won the election, they also sell you what they call a permit to win. Uh, and that basically allows you uh, to govern for the next three years. The Philippines has elections every three years. So this is a very good uh, source of uh, funding uh, for the New People's Army, apart from the already mentioned uh, SOP or revolutionary text. Uh, and uh, this is from a friend of mine. Uh, this shows you uh, credit taking in the uh, electoral system of the Philippines. This is a public toilet. Uh, also is, is near the area where I did uh, most of my research. Um, and uh, this is basically uh, port barrel money coming in. Uh, they build a public toilet, and literally every possible politician who is in the area uh, takes credit uh, for this particular uh, achievement. Uh, most of the money probably went into their pockets, probably, but that's beside the point. So these are some illustrations of what I talked about, and especially the accommodations uh, between uh, different social actors and uh, the state. Uh, so thank you for your attention, uh, and uh, I'm happy to have your questions.